actually see a level one. Ooh, going in aggressive right here. Mega Zero takes a lot of damage. The Counter Strike's available. Stuns out on the one bad breath, but he has to flash away. The Repel goes off from Elise just to mitigate some damage. And Rux goes down the Ninja Ken with first blood there for the pony. He actually, ooh, a good play there by MIA. Hits everybody from Curse Academy. But the Zyra passive goes off, and they're going to wind up trading two for two. Blinking health bars across them at the Bouncing Baby Bomb will not land true. And so far, it's just an even exchange early on. Two for two this game with first blood going to Ninja Ken. Insane amounts of action in that one. Uh, we see that first blood goes to Ninja Ken, so he's going to be able to pick up the, the heftiest chunk of gold and all of that, uh, but then both supports end up picking up a kill, whereas Fabi is able to grab the other kill. Uh, so instead, uh, like the gold is on Ninja Ken instead of on onto, uh, onto Trooper this early on. We'll see exactly what effect this has on the landscape here. Hecarim, a jungler that if he gets out of head, can snowball very, very hard. And he's gone with a, a strong early game item here. He's actually picked up a Doran's Blade to go along with his Hunter Machete and a lot of health potions here. So time will only tell who ends up coming out ahead of that one. Obviously, gold-wise, it goes marginally in ahead of complexity. But we'll see if that gold distribution has an impact in the early game. Well, the distribution has gone down onto the jungler from the side of Complexity, who needs to be a playmaker early on. But the AD carry and support, both from the side of Curse Academy, have picked up that early gold. That translates into some boots, as well as a Doran's Blade for Lucian going head-to-head -head against Caitlyn and Thresh in this matchup. As well as the fact that, let's keep in mind, Curse Academy have burned less summoners in that early engagement than the side of complexity. There's two solo lane, oh, I'm sorry, not their two solo lanes, but their solo lane and their support still have flashes available, which means that Ninja Ken on that Hecarim without his ghost up is going to have a harder time ganking, whereas this early item pressure from the bottom lane may wind up working against complexity early on. We'll have to see though, this is a Lucian without a Thresh this time around, going head-to-head -head against the Caitlyn, and I really want to see how this matchup actually pans out. This is going to be quite interesting to watch. If Caitlyn is able to utilize her range to just abuse the Lucian and not allow him to really get an opportunity and just continue to harass, they will have to be very careful, though, because now that Satsuo has hit level 2, there's a lot of good pressure coming out from that Zyra. That hook isn't going to land on MIA, so a little bit less of that. Although, I mean, that's a that's a haunted Zyra, so it, it's definitely scary. It's scary. Yeah, yeah. Very, very spooky. Many spooks. Every Every single one of those plans is going to be scary. Like that one right there that locks up MIA. Flame misses on the Fabi. There's no ward in that brush, but now there is with a little bit too late. Dash is forward right there. Auto attack going off. One more is going to score a kill onto MIA, but Super, he's going to get one for himself. Flash away from Tatsula. Well, that summoner advantage isn't there anymore. So one kill apiece for the AD carries in that lane, and that's going to be, well, pretty much evened up right there for the side of complexity, but more experience and potential farm going for Super as he stays alive. Absolutely, yeah. That was, I mean, that was a very aggressive play. A beautiful outplay by Satsulo. I mean, he used the plant to block the death sentence. I mean, he just locked it up right in front of him. He was able to lock in my amp as well. So much damage. And then Fabi just completely committed to that. He did anything and everything it took uh, and, and just chased that kill down. And was I mean, he was able to secure it. But then he ended up giving that one back over. And as you mentioned, Trooper being able to shove this lane in, it's going to give him a significant CS advantage. It's going to give him an experience advantage as well. And that, you know, that exchange is going to end up going in favor of complexity. A hero minion blocks the cocoon from one bad Brad as he was almost able to catch on with Trooper right there. But a well-placed 90 caliber net keeps the Piltover Sheriff alive for the time being in this bottom lane. Now met up with Thresh down there. He's going to be content to sit around a little bit and try to extend the CS advantage. With double Dorians and Boots picked up for Fabi, they got to be careful about the kill potential that Lucian has right now. We know how strong of a poker he is, and we've seen how aggressive he can go against the Caitlyn lane, especially as Zyra is going to land one of those grasping roots. But without many summoners left in the bottom lane matchup, one hook or one grab could spell death for either side. Probably in the mid lane getting aggressive on the Jacksonist, but he basically him into a one bad brad cocoon elise secures the kill right there and ziggs goes down in a 2v1 effort great initiation there by woman brad being able to catch that cocoon down and and jackson has just baited that out so well they I mean, just so well probably committed really really hard to that one jackson was just kind of pulled him in on that one no flash was available so he knew that they had the opportunity to take that one back down rux and mega zero i mean they've been they've been at it pretty much the entire time in this top lane rux getting the better of it thus far as he's up 9 cs 10 cs even yeah, Rux actually getting a little bit of the CS advantage over here against Jax, but that's just a little bit of what you expect coming out from an early game Jax, even if it's Mega Zero in this circumstance. Not the strongest in lane in the beginning stages of the game, but he really starts to turn things around later on when he gets some itemization for himself. Bottom lane, we did see a little bit of regression being applied back onto Trooper and MIA. Of course, this is going to be courtesy of the fact that 
Trooper hasn't gone back quite yet. Ninja Kendo is going to come in and assist that top lane Jax just a little bit. Good flag and dragon flash over the wall away from Rux. Ninja Ken not going to be able to catch up to Jarvan quite yet, or is he? Backs away from that situation, and Jarvan's going to get out of there by the skin of his teeth. Very, very nicely played there. Uh, by Rux being able to split Ninja Ken off. So much burst damage coming out from that Hecarim when he runs in there with that devastating charge. It just, uh, or actually, that, oh, that sounds like a poppy skill. I may have just messed up and I may have incensed my character. No, it is devastating charge. <laughs> no, it is the Hecarim. Devastating, okay, is, devastating yeah. blow is the poppy skill. If I know anything, oh, I, I know what and names of skills charge. to hate. Yeah, and heroic charge. Oh, I see, I see. So I kind of combined them there. But in any case, devastating charge coming out from Hecarim. A lot of burst damage just put Rux in a really bad situation. And that's how you punish that aggression. He was very forward, very aggressive in that lane, and Ninja Kim was able to punish him for it. Got the flash off, and now Mega Zero is all caught up in CS. Nicely, nicely played. <laughs> all right, so now we have Mega Zero evening things out in that lane matchup. Also gives him a breath to go back and buy lots of Doran's items acquired. So maybe there's a discount at Doran's workshop for Mega Zero here. But a giant spell has been acquired for Ruck, so he's deciding to go for a bit of a tanky build for his team. Whereas Mega Zero, well, we pretty much know what he's going to go after those Doran's items. Trinity Force has been a hot commodity for Jax players in the top lane, as has been that Blade of the Rune King. We'll have to see what order he gets it in. A lantern in for Ninja Ken means Tatsuno is going to wind up going down right here, despite Chipper looking absolutely delicious. That bottom lane duo gets baited into a kill. Very, very nice gank there, and Ninja Ken is really abusing the mobility of Hecarim in the early game against all these people with no flash. And we talked about how you know the the, the cooldowns for summoner spells were in favor. Oop, one my breath. Oop, oop, Ninja Ken. Oop, they're fighting. Oh, they're fighting over this blue buff area, and looks like that Elise might be getting a little bit of a nice there, but oh, the Mega Inferno Bomb gets repelled on top of, so there's going to be no DPS coming out from that Wasted Probably Ultimate. Bouncing Bomb into MIA, good play right there. Ace in the hole lands on the Jacksmith, so MIA is the one who actually winds up paying with his life for that one. Now we have Fabi coming down into this Dragon Pit area. He's in a 3v Awkward 2 kind of situation right here. Directed Camera is going to pan up into the top lane, but I'm going to look back towards this Dragon Pit area, where once the Dragon has an aggro, on the Prowly, Complexity actually lose one when it looked like they were the ones trying to turn that situation around. That's the burst damage from Brand. Whenever there's another target in the area and there's potential for Pyroplasm, well, my Brad trying to get in on the Prowly. Satchel Chart's going to be good disengage there. But, I mean, you just see the burst damage that Brand is capable of. Was able to pick up that kill on the MIA. Also, nicely played by Jacksmith to position himself to tank up that ace in the hole, as it almost certainly would have been the end of one bet Brad if he allowed that one to go down. Then he retreated into the Dragon Pit, was hoping that no one would follow him and force him to actually burn the flash. He could get out. Probably recognized his plight and uh, just, you know, aggroed the dragon and said, okay, you deal with it. And, uh, and that's what Jacksmith did have to flash over the wall to get himself away from that one. Jacksmith gets out safe, but a summoner spell has been burned in that circumstance for the life of MIA. We did see that Rux was trying to contest the enemy red buff, but as soon as Ping sent down for Mega Zero, he thought twice about it and decided to back away to his own side of the map. And we see him actually going back. He has a Dorian's Blade, a Crystalline Blast, and still rocking that giant spell to hold up his mighty, mighty armor that he's been acquiring over the course of the game so far. Bottom lane side, let's take a look at the matchup here between the AD carries because we have a bit of a different build coming out from Fabi this game. Last game, we saw that Last Whisper and Bloodthirster picked up for, uh, actually, I'm going to shut myself up right here as Trooper actually gets initiated on right there. The culling goes out, chasing down. Fabi getting it blocked by MIA. The hook comes back in on the Tots of the Flame oh. in the tower range. MIA secures the kill right there as the ace in the hole goes on that rapid cooldown from Trooper. And, wow, I wanted to talk about a Trinity Force build from Lucian, but a kill gets picked up right there for Complexity. That was just a fantastic play from MIA. He was so patient about that one. Uh, body blocking out the entirety of the culling. That's one of that spell's weaknesses is, you know, it can get blocked out like that. And that was really nice positioning from MIA. But then he was able to bait it in so far. And, and Satsulo and Fabi both got a little bloodthirsty for that one. They really wanted to be able to pick up that kill when the opportunity wasn't necessarily there. And MIA was able to punish them for it in a big way. That flay, that was that was a lot of damage output, and it the tower of course was on Satsuo, uh, the the squishier of the two at this point in time. Uh, I'm not sure if he had that that ruby crystal or not, but in either case, he just got absolutely melted. Yeah, in that circumstance, the support side is going to be a little bit squishier than the AD carry in some of the early game circumstances, and even going into the later stages of the game. So Tatsalo, well, last time it was MIA that paid for his life in a situation which was turned around by Curse Academy. This time, it's Tatsalo that winds up paying for his life. Again, turnaround from complexity. And now we have a brief moment in time. Malvis, last game, we saw Robert X. Lee going for Bloodthirster last Whisper on Lucian. This time around, Fabi's rushed the Sheen portion of a Trinity Force. What do you think that uh, is up with the item choice this time? 
it's it's kind of one of the two paths that people end up going with Lucian. They either build a more conventional AD carry, uh, which right now involves a lot of, of, of early Bloodthirster builds, or they go with the Trinity Force to synergize with the Ardent Blaze that, come out, that comes out. Like, with the Phage and the Ardent Blaze, also it kind of takes advantage of the fact that he has a lot of burst in the early game. So the Trinity Force, it, it offers a lot, but it doesn't necessarily offer a lot if you kind of fall further behind. It, it's just the kiting potential that you have with Phage plus Art and Blaze. So, I mean, if Fabi's able to get himself out ahead, he can win these trades. But at this point, Trooper has enough sustain that he's not... It, it Like, one trade, like, one advantageous trade from Fabi isn't going to be enough to really get a whole lot of advantage down because he doesn't have the follow-up pressure uh, to actually force something else out uh, from Trooper. It, it's going to take a really solid all-in and probably some presence from one bad Brad to really make that happen. Well, I mean, we've seen popularity of Trinity Force AD carries shrink a little bit, but Corky had been a popular pickup with his Trinity Force versus poke and trade potential after that Sheen proc goes in. Let's keep our eyes peeled on Lucian because I'm really liking the ability to proc that little bit of extra damage, but we'll see what winds up working out for Fabi on Lucian in the bottom side of the map. Chipper, however, has gone for what looks like to be that Bloodthirster build on Caitlyn, which means that these towers, like the outer one on the bottom lane he's willing away on right now, are going to be what he sets his sniper scopes on for complexity. Now, now, Complexity has been known to go for these rotations and take down the outer towers as quickly as possible, but Curse Academy put a damper on the plans, at least for the time being. There hasn't even been a dragon attempt, and it's 12 minutes in. There is going to be a gank attempt here by Ninja Ken, but it gets sniffed out by a pink ward in the tri brush. A little lantern right there from the Thresh Express secures. Hecarim's going to get out of there with his life. Ninja Ken is, uh, he was. I mean, he was a big part of the early game. He's been struggling to really make as much impact in the last couple of minutes. Uh, that, that's relatively common with Hecarim. He does have the ultimate available, so you do need to watch out for that. They, he has so much initiation potential where he can come over a lot of different walls. And whether or not he ends up terrifying you with the ultimate, it's very likely that he'll be able to get behind you and push you into his laner. Uh, but right now, his lanes are, are doing just fine. The goal right now is dead even across the map. As we're also even on kills. And, and the farm numbers are you know, relatively close, close across the map as a whole. Uh, so Ninja Ken, this is about the time where he needs to start making big plays on that Hecarim. Uh, he needs to start getting his team out ahead of this one, and they need to start taking down some of these objectives. As you mentioned, Complexity, a very objective-driven team. That's one of the things that they do the best, and one of the things that they execute the best. They need to start getting that happening right now. Yeah, and so we'll have to see here. They have that bottom tower that had been pushed out from that early trade where Fabi gave his life for a kill against MIA. They've been pushing down there, but as you can see here, the culling is doing a really good job at just dissuading Caitlyn from being able to get too much damage applied onto that tower. And that's one of the reasons why it stayed alive for so long in this bottom lane here. This is letting one bad Brad kind of move around the map and has shut down that early aggression that Ninja Ken was able to get utilizing his first blood. Ever since he really got that kill on the top lane side of the map and then got the lantern, I mean, those are very quick, rapid succession ganks. There's probably been about eight minutes or so where he hasn't really made a huge impact on the map. And if anything, when they were contesting that blue buff, it was actually disadvantageous for complexity. So now we'll have to see where their focus is going to be. That bottom lane tower getting lower and lower, but Trooper gets locked up right there. Is he going to be able to get an ace in the hole onto uh, Zyra right there? He's not. It's on cooldown. A lantern away from Thresh right there is going to save him from Fabi as the AD carry from complexity trades his low health bar for the low health health bar of the support coming out from Curse Academy. Early on in the game, supports trading their HP evenly with opposing AD carries is advantageous for the support because they bring health potions into the lane, they have more sustain. But at this phase of the game, Trooper, I mean, he's got the BF sword, he's got the Vampire Acceptor, he has a lot of sustain. Mega Zero in a 2v1 in the top lane. Oh, Mega Zero, he did have the Mega Inferno Bomb from Prowler on the bottom side, actually. The box goes down from MIA to protect Trooper taking this tower away. Fabi's down extremely low and his mana pool is low as well. Flash throw from Trooper, but it's into a strangle door and a root from Zyra. Totsilo picks up the kill, the ignite goes down from MIA to exact revenge for his AD carry in that circumstance. Now it's a support fight, the most exciting thing in League of Legends. Oh wait, there's a jungler coming in, never mind. Ninja Ken comes in, grassing roots go wide to the right, not gonna wind up picking up a kill onto MIA, and Ninja Ken gets his second kill of the game. There's the pony making an impact on someone who's rift. And so, but we see Curse Academy, they're going to take advantage of the fact, okay, Hecarim's down in the bottom lane. We know that we killed their AD carry as well, so the likelihood of them being able to take down a dragon is not very high. Let's commit our jungler up to the top lane. Let's be sure to get this tower down, extend that lane, and get some global gold going for our team. Uh, ooh, one ja only Jax was in a lot of trouble! Oh, the ultimate had not been popped by Ninja Ken, and Jaxmas finds himself on the receiving end of a lot of pony pain and punishment. The, oh, the Pyroclasm bounced back and forth, but Ninja Ken 
barely gonna survive. 58 HP on my health bar is what I saw right there. One bad breads, Elise is in the area though, but he's gonna set his sights on Prowly as Prowly's gonna have to try to get himself out of there. Not a lot of HP, uh, not a lot of mana left in there, but enough for a satchel charge. He's gonna use it to push one bad bread backwards. The flame goes out from MIA, but what goes up must come down. Hook actually lands onto a plant right there. Not gonna wind it connect the end of one bad bread. Tatsula with another clutch hook denial. Tatsumo has been on point with that. That's that's what you always hope your support Zyra will be able to do in solo queue whenever you see that. Uh, and Tatsumo has, has just been fantastic with this one. Another route going down to the trooper, but it's not going to be enough to dissuade him. He takes down the tower. Now he's in trouble. Nope. Never mind. Nope. He's got, the he's got the Thresh Express out of there, and that's the second outer tower down for complexity. So when we we just kind of talked about this, Malphus. When was that trooper, Caitlyn, going to kick in to rotate around the map and start taking down towers? Well, I guess it's about the 15 and a half minute mark. Yeah, and interestingly enough here, you know, Cupid, the complexity, oh, well, Rux in a lot of trouble getting pushed back in. Another huge satchel charge. Oh man, Rux taking down extremely low, has to flag and drag the heck out of there. Mega Inferno Bomb secures the kill right there. That's a big old splash from Prowley, and he picks up his second kill of the game for complexity with the Jarvan down. He's not the smiter, but he is a very powerful force for Curse Academy at that Sunfire Cape. This is going to net complexity some dragon control as four, almost five of their members of the team are in the area. One bad Brad oh, actually hits the cocoon on Prowley, but the lantern goes out from Thresh. Mega Zero is keeping Fabi at bay on the bottom side of the map, and it looks like an easy acquisition for Dragon while Cheaper holds the mid lane. Cheaper gonna try to keep as much damage off this tower as he possibly can, but he needs to be careful. If a single cocoon lands or one of those seer stuns could be a lot of trouble. Complexity, nope, just Prowley. Coming over here, gonna get some poke down, wants to alleviate the pressure. He knows that his team has control of the dragon. He doesn't need to be in the area, so he just moves up and helps Cheaper out. Yep, so Cheaper gets a little bit of aid from his friends right there. They've taken down the dragon as well, and all of a sudden, it's a 3,000 gold lead for Complexity Gaming at the 17 and a half minute mark. Hook over the wall, finds Tatsulo, in goes MIA, he throws out the lantern, who's gonna take it? Cheaper takes it, he actually takes it right into a pyroclasm though! Oh no, double kill for Jaximus! They do take down Elise, but at what cost? It's going to be one kill picked up back on the Tatsulo. The Cataclysm goes down, Prowley's gonna wind up being shut down right there. The kill goal goes to the AD carry, and Fabi picks one up for himself. A nice fat bounty right there, Mega Zero gets flag and drag, knocked up. Poke coming out there, Ruck secures the kill. In comes a Hecarim charge though, it's gonna pick up a kill on Jaximus. Can Ninja Ken get another kill on the Fabi? No, the dash back into the tower. Ninja Ken takes way too much damage. Now it's Rux coming in. Is he going to be able to pick up a kill on this very elusive Hecarim? He's just dodging over the wall, trying to wait for something. Oh, he found himself a Rux. Flag and Drag doesn't connect. The Ignite goes down in a flash and one quick glove tap. Rux picks up a kill and every member of Complexity in that fight died. That was an extremely extended fight. There's so much kiting all around. So many people trying to get caught out in the jungle or trying to catch their opponents out in the jungle, I should say. I... I, I'm very intrigued by this style of play because Complexity is a team that we've generally expected to, to focus on taking out towers. Uh, but Trooper at this point, I don't know if it was just because of how much gold he had, but he decided to take a little bit different tack. Generally speaking, when we see Caitlyn's do that, they prioritize picking up a Bloodthirster, and a lot of times they'll go for a second item static shiv to allow them to push the creeps even faster and get onto those towers. He's gone for the Infinity Edge this time around, and I think because of that, he felt very, very confident in his team fight power, which he should. I mean, he, he's hitting very, very hard right now. That Caitlyn with the Infinity Edge, you get a headshot prop with the bonus damage. It's a lot. It's a lot, lot, lot. But right now, he was in a bad position. Jax was just able to blow him up, and the rest of his team was not in the best place after it, uh, where they don't have that consistent auto attack damage output coming out from Trooper. So, Complexity need to be a little bit more careful about when they go for a big fight like that. And uh, it looks like they're going to play a little bit more patiently and go back to the just taking away towers game. Yeah, and as you saw right there, the hesitation to take the Lantern into a brand that they potentially knew had his ultimate available. The bouncing Hieroclasm right there just did too much damage. Now it's a bit of a dual and split push situation here. Caitlyn and Thresh are in the top lane, whereas Mega Zero is applying a lot of pressure on Nefabi. But with that Trinity Force already acquired and none on the side of Mega Zero, he has to flash away. Barely getting out of that one. If I my count is correct, he had about 60 HP on that account there. So Fabi definitely winning the duel against Jax in the earlier stages of this game. But now four members, actually three members of Complexity, are sieging down on this last outer tower from Curse Academy. But there is a staunch defense of three members of their own trying to stop Complexity from pushing down the remaining towers on the map. This is a... Uh... I mean, right now, Mega Zero, the biggest issue he has is the fact that he has very, very limited sustain. And there's at least a Vamp Scepter over here for, this, for Fabi. So even if he goes in to try to trade with Fabi, if he doesn't crush him and dominate him in that trade, 
or continue to apply pressure after the trade and, and make him continue to trade auto attack damage and just keep going at it, then Fabius is able to heal himself back up and go back in and Mega Zero, he doesn't have you know, the ability to make that happen, at least not as well. Well, in this top lane, we see a lot of poke from that Caitlyn, as well as the Ziggs. The Mega Inferno Bomb was used to push them away from the tower, ace in the hole as well, dishing out a lot of supplemental DPS and forces Curse Academy back. The Minefield being laid and Thresh going forward. The Flash Blade misses, but the boss connects. Jacksmith uses his ultimate, but it doesn't really bounce to anybody. It's going to be a kill picked up for Caitlyn, while Brand picks up a kill on Thresh. One Bouncing Bomb is not going to land on Tatsuleta, so it's a one-for-one -one trade and a tower also acquired by Complexity. Oh, Mega Zero wants this dive? No, he doesn't. Ooh, he, he doesn't want the dive as soon as Alicia shows up. He's like, uh uh, let's back up from that one. Yeah, that, that could have been pretty catastrophic if Ninja can pull the trigger on that ultimate. If he was going back in, if Mega Zero made the call to commit hard, then Ninja Kim would have gone back in, and Fabi in that 2v1 would not have stood up, even with the tower helping him out. But the fact that Gwen Brad was in the area, that would have been catastrophic for Complexity if they tried to execute that dive. But, you know, they're going to be pretty content with the way things are going out so far for them. They're leading by about 2,000 gold, so we're hitting the 21-minute mark, which is not a colossal gold lead, but it's enough, and they're biding their time. They're waiting until they can hit their, their, their big item break points. Like, probably at this point has the Athenes and Holy Grail, so he's got the mana regeneration, a little bit of ability power, and the cooldown reduction, which is which is really the biggest part of that. He needs to pick up the death cap to increase the potency of that poke, and they're waiting for Mega Zero to hit his Trinity Force, and potentially start building in towards a second item, whatever that second item may be. That's really the face of the game where Jack starts getting really out of control, and apparently someone is knocking on the door of the Complexity House. Yeah, my ass is, hold on a second, I gotta answer the door, and Jack's miss replies with, it's me, guys, so, uh, don't know if that's actually going to be the way that Curse Academy decides to gank complexity in real life or not, but we'll end up finding out as soon as the pause winds up dispersing right here. But Curse Academy, at this point, they have fallen slightly behind in the gold count. It's not the 3,000 gold lead that complexity had before, but it's still 2,000 gold, which is a sizable amount, about the 22-minute mark right here. The kills, however, are fairly close. The only thing that complexity is really leading in is that objective control that they've gotten. The farm counts are a little bit skewed here, as Mega Zero has a little bit more. We have probably with a little bit more in the mid lane matchup, but Fabi is a bit further ahead of Chupa than everybody else in that little discrepancy between their CS counts. But the dragons for complexity are definitely keeping them far ahead in the game as well as the towers. The next one, that dragon that is, is going to be up in about a minute and 14 seconds. Both teams kind of know about this one. Tatsulo is going to start denying or at least trying to gain back vision from complexity by picking up that oracle's elixir he has currently over his head. We see him moving down with one bad Brad to try to put wards in this area because they know complexity took the last dragon, but they don't necessarily necessarily know the exact timer and they want to sweep out those wards before complexity establishes complete control all right so the teams are readying up here's going to be the resume as yeah i mean this this will actually only be the second dragon of the game uh, mm -hmm. be because hecarim doesn't necessarily have that great dragon control necessarily compared to a champion like elise where we see nintendo decks like soloing dragon as at least at level seven <laughs> where he's just like okay i can do this now and it just goes and makes it happen ninja can doesn't necessarily have that option on hecarim but generally speaking, Complexity have had a little bit more control in that area in the map because they had the Caitlyn Thresh. They were consistently applying pressure and pushing. Uh, so One Bad Brad didn't necessarily have an opportunity to try to make any sort of big early dragon plays happen either. So we're in a situation where the first dragon doesn't go down until, I mean, this, let's see, the second one's about to spawn at like 23 minutes. So the first one didn't go down until the 17 minute mark. That's considerably later than the average first dragon time. And it's, you know, it's just been indicative of how much rotation and how kind of chaotic this game has really been. As complexity have been trying to take advantage and continuing to push uh, Curse Academy back further and further on the map, trying to deny them more and more farm and try to just pick up more and more of the map resources. Well, chalk it up to the patented Caitlyn strategy, taking down the bottom tower first, rotating towards the mid one, and then establishing dominance in that jungle area around the dragon pit. Complexity is not letting Curse Academy get away with free vision, as now we see MIA has an Oracle's Elixir of his own. They're also not letting one of the tankier members of their team group up in that chot lane Jarvan, as he's going to be held at bay by Jax. So we actually do have Trooper taking a lot of damage from that culling, which I know Twitch chat doesn't think it deals damage, but when you got a Trinity Force and a BF Sword on Fabi's Lucian, it definitely deals a lot of damage. Yeah. Could we say that it deals tons of damage? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's the culling. I don't know if it deals tons of damage. But 
at the same exact time, while our puns of plenty are going down, Curse Academy has utilized that Elise to go over the wall and have secured the dragon for themselves. So that's objective going for them. And they got a pincer move right now in Complexity's backline. MIA says, surprise, here's a box. Misses the hook going down into one bad Brad. Flash over the wall from Jacksonville. Pyroclasm hits four members of Complexity. Now it's cleanup duty for Rux. Mega Zero takes out Jacksonville, but Rux in the back line have taken out Trooper already. MIA is going to be the next one to fall down. Mega Inferno Bomb as well as a Hecarim charge go across the bottom side of the screen. It's two for Mega Zero and two for Rux, but another one has been picked up here by one bad Brad. Rux flashes way over the wall, and Fabi still at a relative high amount of HP. Forces away Complexity. All in all, it's a three for two trade in favor of Curse Academy and net them a dragon. That was a really brave play by Jack Smith flashing in to get that Pyroclasm down. Uh, and if he had survived any longer to get any more of his spells down, he arguably could have just killed everyone all on his own. Like, when it really comes down to it. I mean, that was that's so much damage. Pyroclasm plus the Pillar of Flame combined there with the fact that I'm pretty sure that that did hit everybody at least once. So a Conflagration would have, like, on any target, would have spread the damage to everybody else. Like, that would have been an insane amount of burst damage if he had stayed alive for even just another rotation. Uh, so a really, really brave play from Jax. Really brave play coming out from Fabi as well, as he's the one kind of starting the fight, like, dashing out ahead of Elise. As he just, he, that's, that's how eager he is to start the fight. And he was right to do so. I mean, you saw at the end of the fight, Fabi is still, you know, at enough health to zone Mega Zero away when he was considering trying to find an opportunity to chase down Rux and pick up that kill, as he knew Rux had basically no health when he got himself back out over that wall. So very, very nice team fighting coming out there from Curse Academy, but it's not enough to close the gold gap down completely. They're still down 1,000 gold, but a 1,000 gold gap at the 25-minute mark is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. The thing they have to watch out for is that the clock is still ticking on Mega Zero's Jax. He's got the Trinity Force, and now he's picked up a Bilge Water Cutlass. If he picks up that Blade of the Ruin King and starts itemizing Tanky, this is going to be a tough, tough fight for anybody on Curse Academy to take him down. You mentioned that 1,000 gold lead. If we hit the X button and check out the gold distribution tab, we can see that it's not all too much. It's spread fairly even amount the team. 100 or so in favor of Mega Zero, a couple hundred in favor of Prowly, and in the bottom lane matchup, it's actually Fabi that comes out ahead of Trooper despite more kills being on Trooper. That CS differential being just a little bit too much for Caitlyn to keep up with. No, the gold count actually winds up favoring the junglers a little bit more, as Ninja Ken has a couple hundred gold lead over one bad Brad. But a couple hundred gold Gold here, a couple hundred gold there, doesn't really make for a large completed item difference as Curse Academy recognizes and try to go in for a fight. Rux is in the back lines locking up Ninja Ken, but he's the tanky character here. Mega Zero finds a Jackson is in the middle of the fray. He gets obliterated right there. Lots of damage coming out from the culling as well as Rux force Mega Zero back out of the fight, but Ninja Ken still has an ultimate primed and ready. Hook lands onto Rux. MIA is going to wind up not going in on that one. A flag and drag away in complexity. Set their sights on the objective. That's the fourth tower of the game for Complexity Gaming, and they trade in a one-for-none situation, forcing Curse Academy back into their face. And they're taking advantage of the additional range that they have. They're just abusing the fact that they have Caitlyn. They're abusing the fact that they have Ziggs. Whenever they make this big team fight happen, they know that they have enough pressure, even if they're not all necessarily full health. They know that they have enough pressure to make this happen. They have Mega Zero pushing up in the top lane. They're trying to bait this one out to see if anyone comes out of the base a little bit too quick as the rest of the team stands over there lying in wait. They will not find anything there, but they do claim two towers after that fight. Beautiful play coming out there from Complexity. That's going to be enough to extend that gold lead back up to 3,000. Well, we talked about this earlier on in Champion Select. Curse Academy, they are known for their fight compositions. Whereas Complexity, we saw with that pickup from Trooper, is uh, he misses, doesn't get the lantern right there. Ninja Ken takes that one for himself. But with Trooper on Caitlyn, they're known for their objective-based control play. And we see them going back to that right here after Curse Academy has started to turn the tide in these team fights. Now, they're able to use that Hecarim ultimate they saved to get a clean escape right there. But now it's Curse Academy that are going to be rushing for a Baron attempt. They're forcing Complexity to react. Either give this Baron up, or you have to fight us. And while if Trooper wants to fight him all by himself, Curse Academy is ready for that one. He's going to wind up just getting melted right there under the sheer power of the five strong from Curse Academy. Mega Inferno Bomb goes off a little bit too early, and Baron gets picked up off the back of two towers that were in favor of Complexity. But Curse Academy nets the Nasher, and now they are marching down mid lane. Yeah, Curse Academy was a nice, I, I believe we call that the comeback Nasher, uh, when, when teams are not in position after they just made a big push and they have to go back and heal. Very, very nice play from Curse Academy to recognize that they had the opportunity to make that happen. Ninja Ken, you know, he had a good escape there on the Wraith Pony, trying to get himself away from that one, but he did have to burn the ultimate, so they felt very confident that there was not even a potential uh, for any sort of smite steal action coming out here. Now they're trying to collapse down, they take down two towers, and here's the initiation! 
Oh, Rux just blows up Prowley in the back lines, and he's very tanky, but he's taking a lot of damage from the combined efforts of Complexity. Mega Zero gets the kill on that one, but with the tower down, Fabi is free to charge forward, gets the shutdown spree on Mega Zero, and now one of the beefiest members of Complexity is no longer available to defend this Baron Siege from Curse Academy. They're going to wind up taking down three towers in the mid lane and the inhibitor. One Baron nets them three and more as Complexity are now on the back foot, not only in the pressure on the map, but in the gold count, the kill count as well. Very, very nice to be there by Curse Academy. This game has swung so far. It was 1,000 gold in favor of Complexity. Then it became 3,000 gold in favor of Complexity. Now it's 1,500 gold in favor of Curse Academy. Is that just a huge, huge turn of events there? Just massive for them as they pick up so many towers. They grab the first inhibitor of the game. They grab the first Baron of the game, and they're in a position to continue. They can just select a side lane, get one side lane pushing. They could even use Jarvan as a split pushing threat, and have everyone else go in the other direction and start taking down some of the rest of these towers. If they're able to grab some of these towers, if they're able to continue picking up these objectives, they might be able to just get this uh, this gold lead snowballed out to an insurmountable advantage. Well, the objective right now is Dragon, and it does get smited right there by Ninja Ken. The Pyroclasm coming out from Jacksmith is not going to bounce a security kill. Super Minion also wants to come in and try to help out his Cursed Academy brethren, but Complexity take his life for that one. So there's going to be an objective going back in favor of Complexity, and despite the gold counts being closed within 1,000 apiece, you can't forget now that there are Super Minions like that one that gave his life for Cursed Academy, threatening Complexity's base and threatening that mid lane right now. So you see, Fabi has picked up a Guardian Angel right now. He's got Trinity Force, Bloodthirster, Guardian Angel. As he's, this is interesting. I, I, he's concerned about getting burst down by the Ziggs, uh, by Hecarim just prioritizing him and taking him down. Uh, as he's going to go ahead and use the calling. Rex wants to make this fight happen. Oh man, MIA has to put that in the box, gets a play off, but in the back lines, Rux is just decimating Prowley and Trooper. He's taking a lot of damage for it in the meantime, though. Stranglethorns it laid down as Lucian did pick up the kill on MIA's Thresh. Hecarim is actually joining in the back of the fray as Fabi goes unstoppable. Mega Zero is split pushing his little Jack's heart out, but his team is dying at the same exact time. It is a two for zero trade in favor of Curse Academy in what was a 4v4 fight situation. Now that Rux has actually gone back to base and heal, Mega Zero jumps in on Jack. Smith, but he's gonna find Jarvan as well. There's no Cataclysm Ultimate. The Opyroclasm actually goes down from Jackson. Mega Zero in a duel to the death. He wants to go one for one, but it's not gonna wind up working out. In the meantime, across the map, Curse Academy is pushing down onto the bottom inhibitor tower. Ninja Ken trying to do all he can to defend against Fabi, but he's actually gonna wind up giving up that tower there. The inhibitor is gonna go down as well. Three members of Curse Academy. Baron Buff still ticking away on them. This Baron has been well worth it. They get two inhibitors for that. They get five towers on the map, and they pick up a Mega Zero Split Pusher. This has been fantastic play. Fabi's not done. He's using the Cullink. Will not be able to pick up that kill on the MIA as he forces him back out. But so much poke going back down. They're trying to make something happen and grab this Nexus Tower, but they will not have the opportunity to do so as Trooper has made his way back out to the fray. He's going to be able to get a lot of damage down here. We'll be able to deter any further pushing on the Nexus for now. But Cursed Academy are fine with that because they have an opportunity to take down even more towers. And one thing that I really like out of Fabi's Lucian plays, he's not afraid to use the culling. It only has a 50 second cooldown. Might not be up for this fight though. Ninja Ken winds up going down onto one bad brab. The hook lands onto Fabi with the Guardian Angel. He might not be the prime target to try to jump in and just assassinate right out of the get go. Rux takes down that top main tower as now Curse Academy has turned the tower game against complexity. Eight compared to five at this point in time as Ninja Ken decides it's time to go in. Rux wants to go into his back lines with a flag and drag. And now Mega Zero is left to take up everything because Ninja Ken got so low. He winds up going down. Trooper in the back lines has to try to get away. Barry has been popped. But Cullen gets a kill on Prowley. Lantern goes out to keep Trooper alive, but Complexity are retreating into the depths of their base. Play does not connect onto Rux. Fabi goes forward. Double kill for him. Mega Zero heals up with the home guards. Tries to jump down onto anybody from C Curse Academy. And he does get a kill for Trooper. They jump down onto Fabi. He has to pop his barrier, but his guard. Guardian Angel is still active on the map. Four members of Curse Academy are up, two members of Complexity are available, and that's going to be for 20 more seconds. Never mind, it's just one. Chipper went down to Jacksmith in that circumstance, and now it's all up to Mega Zero. He gets one, he gets a Guardian Angel, but he's going to fall himself. That is an ace for Curse Academy. No Nexus Towers alive. Curse Academy with the comeback against Complexity, and they take the final game of the evening. Fantastic play there from Curse Academy. Just prioritizing their targets so well, drawing these team fights out. Ninja can he, he couldn't really initiate, 
Like there was no opportunity for him to go in. He tried to force an initiation. He tried to finally make something happen, but he couldn't get behind the carries. With Hecarim, you always want to get behind the carries, terrify them into the team, then use that devastating charge to push them further in and get a lot of burst damage down. Was not able to make that one happen. They did not find any opportunities for Mega Zero to kind of split off and get some solid 1v1s down. And Satsulo just had a terrific game on Zyra. He is the one that took Trooper out of that fight at the end of the game there. He got a good route down, and that set up Jaximus to just land his spell combo in a perfect order. You know, he just got the got the, uh, the conflagration down, then stunned him up with the Seer, and then Pillar of Flame, and that was it. Trooper ceased to exist. So every single member of Curse Academy playing their champions to fantastic effectiveness, all working together and getting a very, very nice come-from-behind win. Well, that's the Cursed Academy mentality. When in doubt, fight it out. And they've done that with their bruiser composition, and they do it here with a normal standard kind of composition as well. Standard, of course, also relying on the fact that that top lane Jarvan from Rux, who's able to go head-to-head -head with Mega Zero for majority of the laning phase, and even though he had slightly less CS than his top lane counterpart, he was 6-4-12 and 12 and made a huge huge impact on the game for Curse Academy. But even though that game was extremely, extremely massive there, Malthus, we've had a slew of awesome games today. And it all started off with Velocity Esports taking the win against Cognitive. VVV and GGLA slugged it out against a new GGLA lineup where the new boys in town wind up taking home the victory against an established VVV gaming. Napkins in disguise against To Be Determined. TBD showed all out aggression and diced up Napkins in disguise, taking a victory there. And as you guys just saw here, Curse Academy with a come from behind victory through the power of complexity gaming, sealed a victory and net themselves another win in the Ancient Golem Conference. Curse Academy have been on a roll of late. They have been looking fantastic. Uh, whether they're playing with their, their less convinced conventional composition or even if they're going back to something a little bit more standard a little bit more in the meta they've just been having so much fun and it they've been having a lot of success too it's been it's been quite a joy to watch well, guys, this action is going to continue straight into tomorrow because the NACL is on four days a week. Same time, same channel on Twitch. We're going to start off tomorrow with Velocity Esports going up against Team Coast. Then Napkins in Disguise look to bounce back, but they got a hard target in their way against Complexity Gaming. Then Curse's main squad takes to the rift against Cognitive Gaming, hungry for a win in their own Elder Lizard division. And then to wrap it up, Curse Academy going up against VVV Gaming in what I can only imagine will be a bunch of champions that we'd never ever seen before on the rift all at the same time <laughs> and the only thing we have left to expect from these teams at this point is that they'll do something completely unsex unexpected <laughs> completely unexpected indeed malvis but guys it's been the nacl of course it's been day one of week six so there's plenty more action to come guys don't forget to check out our sponsors below loot crate geek and gaming gear subscribe